welcome to this Intelligence Squared podcast with me, Helen Joyce. I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Helen Rose. She's the editor of Aero magazine and co-author with James Lindsay of a new book, Cynical Theories, How Activist Scholarship Made Everything About Race, Gender and Identity and Why This Harms Everybody. It's out now. Oh, thank if, you for inviting me. <laughs> oh, it's very exciting to have you on. I really enjoyed the book. I actually uh, bookmarked it as soon as I heard about it several months ago because I thought that's a book I need to read. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm never quite sure. People always seem to have an opinion very far in one direction or the other. <laughs> well, that's the world we live in. And actually, that's something we're probably going to talk about, isn't it? I wanted to start with that word cynical. I have the book on my phone. I don't have a print copy or I'd show our audience. But you've got the word critical and you've the word cynical written over it. So it's like critical theories, but cynical theories instead. Cynical. What's cynical? OK, so when postmodernism postmodernism arose it was defined as a skepticism towards meta narratives and what annoys us is that this particular approach this this critical approach considers itself to be the epitome of skepticism whereas in fact being skeptical of meta narratives has been something that had been happening throughout the modern period this is what the whole sort of scientific revolution was about how do i know this is true so we say that the, the theories that came out of these postmodern ideas aren't sceptical because sceptical is doubtful and it's still in search of some kind of truth. It's cynical because it begins with the assumption that everything is about power imbalances and people trying to protect their power and then it reads society through it. So no idea about how people are working in, you know, it together sometimes, in opposition sometimes, but towards some variety of truth or objectivity or understanding or any of those things? Yeah, exactly. I think um, uh, jo uh, Alan Sokol and Jean Brickman, they, they wrote, uh, wrote it very well. They said there's a specific scepticism in which we say, how do we know this is true? And then we work out how to find out if it is true, how to falsify it if it isn't true. And this is interesting and productive. If you've got the kind of radical scepticism of the postmodern approach, you don't even look for truth. You, you just start with this idea that we can't actually obtain truth. And what's interesting is is what power dynamics are being are in play here so you've said the word power several times here and i do want to come back to that but i want to say just one more thing i'll get you to comment on one more thing before we do that so you've said now twice i think meta narrative mm. so they're skeptical about meta narratives but it sounds like what you're saying is there is a meta narrative they have their own Yes, this is um, the, the third generation. So in the 60s, uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, he described postmodernism as a scepticism towards meta narratives, And that's all those big overarching explanations for things. So Christianity, obviously, Marxism, um, but science and progress as well. So he was sceptical of that. And so were all of the first postmodernists. They really took things apart. Um, they didn't really try to build anything. But as these few core ideas about power, knowledge and language have evolved over the last 50 years, they have formed a meta narrative of their own now. So power, knowledge and language. And from reading your book, power is what people have kind of innately because of their characteristics and language is what brings the whole thing together by how we talk about it in our discourses. And knowledge is what we're creating by discoursing, if that's a verb. Is that about right? Yes. So um, it's uh, Michel Foucault, particularly, who joined the words power and knowledge to make one power knowledge. And this is what underlies everything. So it isn't that um, people are deliberately trying to exercise power over others necessarily. It's that people are born into certain positions in society that gives them a certain relationship to power. The powerful forces get to decide what is knowledge and what isn't. And then this is legitimized and everybody speaks um, through this these discourses of, of knowledge, which are really discourses of power. So they can be called things like um, white supremacy, patriarchy, cis normativity, heteronormativity. And we're all upholding them all the time by assuming that um, there is knowledge that is legitimate about these things. So we've been quite abstract up to now. We've talked about things like meta narratives and discourses. And now you've started to hint at some rather specific versions of this. In the book, you give a chapter each to several of these cynical theories so you know critical race theory etc cetera, etc cetera. let's pick race since you mentioned uh you mentioned the white fragility or the white supremacy sort of idea that's very topical right now and we have books like um with people like robin d'angelo um talking about white fragility and so on. what's wrong with that i mean 
we, we, do, we do live in a world where, um, you know, people have been horribly oppressed on the basis of race. There, there, is, there is a hierarchy here. So are, are they getting it completely wrong? Have they got some aspect of it right? They're getting the approach wrong. So if we're going to look at um, racism, there are a, a number of different ways to do this. So the liberal approach to racism, which was uh, kind of put forward by Martin Luther King, for example, this aims to take significance out of identity categories. So, you know, while being black or being a woman could be important to your sense of who you are, it shouldn't tell society anything about your moral or social value or what role you should play in the world. So this is what the liberal approach is. When critical race theory arose, it took aim at that um, particularly, it didn't agree with the liberal approach of trying to be colorblind. It obviously, it, it tends to interpret that as a willingness to be blind to racism, which isn't at all the same thing. If you think being colorblind is a, is a, is a positive thing that we should, try, we should aim for in a society, it means you oppose people who are not being colorblind, people who are being racist. So when we look at racism, we need the most rigorous scholarship that's out there. And there are some very, very rigorous uh, scholars out there. They um, take a materialist empirical approach. So you could look at the um, research into the criminal justice system by someone like Michelle Alexander, for example, and you will find her looking at systems, at, at laws, at numbers, and she'll be analyzing this in a, in a, in a strong and steady way. But if you go with somebody like Robin D'Angelo, she is all about um, theory, her own interpretation of how all white people must think, how all black people must experience things. She wants um, people to admit, uh, all white people to admit that they have been socialized into believing that black people are inferior in various ways and then work to dismantle that even though that isn't actually ever possible. So one of her um, when she, she wrote a, a, a number of tenets with a team and one of them was the question is not does race, did racism occur but how did racism manifest in this situation so it's assumed to always be there. It reminds me very much of the logic of the ducking stool you know you've got the you know if the witch sinks she wasn't a witch and if she floats well we'll burn her so there's just no way out there's nothing that you can do in this situation. No, exactly. There's um, D'Angelo, she gives us two choices. You can either be racist and acknowledge it and work against it, or you can be, in, be racist and in selfish denial of it. So it's unfalsifiable, and that's obvious. That's a, a feature. That's not a bug, I guess, because mm. she doesn't want anybody denying it. How can this actually have caught on when I thought we had you know, I thought we had actually solidified the idea that what was the power of the modern world was that we had theories that we could test and we could falsify them and we could reject them if they weren't good enough and replace them by new ones. How did that even catch on? This is what has been being undermined. This is the liberal approach and it's what Jonathan Rausch calls liberal science, that process where everybody can raise any idea they want, anybody else can challenge that idea. There's the belief that we can all get at ideas and examine them on their own merits and that the individual has agency to reject some ideas and uphold others. So this to the postmodernists is very, very naive. It's either um, an extreme uh, naivety and an inability to see the invisible powers uh, power structures or it's a selfish attempt to protect one's own privilege so you see to some extent there, there is of course truth in this because if we look at how our understanding of homosexuality has changed for example dominant discourses for a long time said it was a heinous sin then it said it was a, a shameful disorder now the dominant discourse around homosexuality is some people are gay get over it so this has changed, but whereas the liberals would say this has changed because we were able to look at it, talk about it, discuss it, apply science to it, and um, you know, really sort of compare arguments for what homosexuality is, does it have any moral valence at all? And that was how we overcame um, prejudice against homosexuality. But the the, the discourse theorists, the, the descendants of the postmodernists would say this is naive and what all that has happened is that um, the ways of talking about things have changed. We are still living in a very um, heterocentrist and uh, cis-centrist society and that those power structures are, are still there and they still need to be dismantled. And they think that we're going to do that by changing the way that we talk about things. Yes, precisely. If, if language creates social reality, changing language can create a better one. And if you think that, like, if one thinks that uh, we're in this 
sort of invisible web, this, this power web, um, where all of us are positioned according to our characteristics. Uh, we maybe even don't see these things until somebody has taught us the techniques of critical whatever theory. And how can, it, like it sounds like we're trying to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps if you believe that you can change the way that you talk and that will change reality. Like it, it is incredibly pessimistic and I don't know how they think, if you think like that, how they think that you can even change your language. Well, I, some theorists have argued that that it's almost impossible. Christy Dotson, um, for example, when she does her um, conceptualizing conceptualizing epistemic oppression, she says that third level, that one where you have to try to to even speak in the language that you have, trying to see that there is a problem when you only have the language, the the epistemic resources that you have is almost impossible. So there is a lot of um, of pessimism there, but there's also a certain simplicity to it and there's a certain appeal to it because people feel as though we're only at the beginning. We can't, they don't know, not even that the most advanced theorists um, in the world know all how, exactly how this power system works but what we're doing is we're picking at it we're we're digging at it we're trying to see it we're uncovering more bits of it because it's unfalsifiable somebody can identify racism within any interaction and as long as it's um according to the theory it will be deemed authoritative it will be correct so there's there's a lot of um a lot of, of room for people to play with these ideas for them to interpret things and and to them feel like you're really uncovering new ground and, and setting the the scene for improving things right so they feel like they're making progress because when there's no falsifiability everything is sort of progress every bit of thing that you say yeah and it, it's beginning to be able to see it that that's right. the thing d'angelo often says we need to make it visible and then we can get at it I mean, I think the second bit of that doesn't necessarily follow from the first, but since I don't agree with the first either, I think that's kind of irrelevant. Um, I thought it was very interesting the way you talked. I think it was, it was um, maybe in an article just very recently, uh, you said this thing about what cancel culture really is. I thought it was a great explanation that the point of cancel culture is that if people are saying wrong things and those wrong things are creating wrongness, then silencing them is an extremely moral thing to do. Mm. and silencing them by any means really um, and you don't have to debate them debating them will be bad have i got yeah. that about right yes exactly I, th I think this makes intuitive sense to humans i mean th this is why there have been such strong um laws against heresy and blasphemy because the idea is you can corrupt society you can taint and damn others so you know when we had awful things like the inquisition this was a moral endeavor because the attempt was to stop this corruption from spreading and damning a lot of people to hell and so yes they wanted to put very very strong disincentives in place for people to question um, the orthodoxy of, of religion now this is a different situation because we're in a different time but the same um the same oh, sorry my husband has not got his keys can you let daddy in please <laughs> Shall I ask you the question again? I think you were going really well, so I don't want to. Maybe, maybe from the Inquisition, that was good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we, um, yeah, e even with things like the Inquisition, which were was such a, a sort of terrorising um, thing, there was a moral imperative uh, underneath that. The idea was that if people... Um, speak heresy if they they challenge the um, the orthodoxy the the truth of God this this can um, this this will corrupt and um, and taint the rest of society and, and cause and cause people to be damned to hell so there's this incentive to really make um, to, to ensure that people are thinking and speaking in the right way for the good of everybody and that's what you get right now I mean the the strongest mantra I think that people are wanted are expected to repeat at the moment is trans women are women and so what, no matter what you actually believe about trans identity I'm um, uh, fully in support of trans trans rights and I, people identifying as they wish to with you know there's obviously conversations that need to be happen about spaces and sports but no matter what you think about this we it's difficult to notice that the emphasis is is very much on language are you saying things which suggest that trans women aren't women? The way to respond to that is not with an argument. So we don't have people arguing back and forwards as much as we have them um, throwing mantras at each other as if they're trying to um, 
to, to out outspeak each other on the level of these discourses. If I say trans women are women, often enough, if enough people say it, that will make the social reality be what is needed for the acceptance of trans people. Yeah, I, it's interesting because I had, I must say, I had sort of thought that anyone who hung on to a mantra that much couldn't possibly really believe it. You know, that if you're, if you feel secure in your own ideas, I'd always thought, but then this just shows that I'm from a previous generation. I always thought if you were secure in your ideas, you wouldn't mind debating them. You'd feel confident that you could answer any criticism that people put forward. But I think what you showed, uh, you know, and, and you, you gave me a different way to conceive of this, was that the very saying of these things was a harm. And I hadn't understood that before, that, you know, I was creating an evil, according to these people, by saying things, even possibly if I was saying them on my own in a room. Mm. You know, I'm not even meant to think them. I'm not even meant to say them in my head, I guess. Yeah, I mean, this is why we get the argument that um, gender critical feminists are involved in the murder of trans women, even though, you know, trans women do seem to be particularly vulnerable to violence. But this isn't, um, has never been by a gender critical feminist. But there's this idea that they're speaking into a narrative that devalidates, invalidates, delegitimizes um, trans people. It creates a hostile environment and one in which it is acceptable for them to be abused by people who have completely different ideas and aren't feminists at all. So it's um, yeah. It it's, seems it seems quite remarkable. I mean, it's you know, I mean, I lived in Brazil for several years, and I mean that is one of the places where trans women are murdered. I mean, mm. you know, it's actually one of the hotspots of it in Rio de Janeiro because there's a lot of street workers there. You know, yeah, they're not listening to what gender critical feminists are saying. I mean, these men, it's nothing to do with. It's nothing to do with that. It's you know, some mixture of violence, homophobia, to be honest, self hatred, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, and just being violent. Mm. Is anyone really so convinced if they think it through or is the point that they're stopping themselves from thinking it through by saying the mantra? Like, is it a thought stopping cliche? I, I think it's I have a tendency to think that it is actually quite normal, quite intuitive to humans to think that our words have more power than they do. I think um, that the idea that if we can just get everybody saying the right thing, everything will be OK actually makes a lot of sense to us we're a storytelling species so i think what's more counterintuitive to us is the idea that there can be worth in getting people together who have two different uh, views on a thing and getting them to argue their own side using evidence and a reasoned argument this this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to a lot of the activists right now and it hasn't made a lot of sense historically i think people like um you and i and our our generation and people who have been involved in having these kind of conversations we can it seems that this is the obvious way you know we talk about things we we exchange ideas this is how we progress but it doesn't seem to be that intuitive to a lot of people yes yeah, so maybe it was a brief period but it was a brief and very glorious period i think it's something talk. we have to <laughs> yeah we have to hang on to it we have to const constantly reinforce it otherwise it we are likely to lose it and it will be the most powerful narrative wins so what, let's see, um, I want to ask you what you think this means for two particular large areas, very important areas of society that I think are really under attack at the moment. And one is academia and the other one is journalism. Mm. So academia seems to have pretty much fallen to these ideas, at least large chunks of it. I, th I think it's certainly um, very much overpowered by it. Of, of course, you get, um, I, I don't think the majority of academics hold these views. And you don't find them in, a, in every field. They're really sort of concentrated in a cluster in the humanities and also on campus culture. But mm -hmm. anybody who goes against them is likely to find themselves in trouble. So this is what I, was, I found when I'm studying um, late medieval women's religious writing. Now, I can look, I can do work that I can be proud of as long as I'm not looking at what um, sex is, what gender is, how it works in any way that's going to go against the dominant narrative. You know, so if somebody wanted to be a historian and they wanted to look at agriculture or something, they could go through their whole lives without coming uh, cropper with this but if you're a scientist and you want to look at say how sex differences exist between men and women then you're going to find yourself in trouble. It's interesting isn't it because I think that's a bit of it that people don't see if they're outside what we might call a knowledge producing industry so I'll count journalism as that even even if it's not very fair that it's it's the it's the self-censorship it's before you even get to the area that's touchy so it's not, it's not about the people who were sacked it's about the people who never said anything more than anything else. Yes. 
Uh, I hear it from a lot of academics and I hear from a lot of people generally who write to me and say, I, you know, I think I'm the only person in my organization who is concerned about this. And then quite often now I happen to know that they're not and I can put them in touch with somebody else. And I, I think there's a lot more people who are um, concerned about it or who at least don't agree with it. I think with a lot of liberals on the left who still actually have those kind of um, beliefs that I'd like them to have about the value of different ideas and, and the exchange of debate and consistent principles, they tend to understand the social justice approach as a more friendly and liberal thing than it is and feel that they should be supportive of it and the scholars producing it because the problem on the right is um, is a more severe one if you if you are a leftist yes we're going to worry about the rise of, of right-wing populists and they then get rather annoyed with people on the left who are saying yes but this is a problem that's on the left it, it is a problem we do need to address it and more than that they're connected aren't they uh, I people, think so. Yeah, so you tell me about how you think they're connected then. I, I don't think, I, I think there are two ways. If you, if you are a leftist and you want left-wing parties to win and be able to um, institute left-wing policies, there are two things you have to do. You have to show the problem with the party on the right and you have to make your own party a strong one and one that people can respect. And I don't think that's happening on the left at the moment. I think that there's this division between the identitarians, the radicals and the liberals on the left and at the moment the identity politics left is the one that is most visible it's the one that corporations and politicians feel that they have to appease and i think it's driving people right now i can't know how many people went right because of this and um, so it's, it's not very helpful to guess but i do think that if we could have a more consistently liberal left then we could see then we'd have been a better chance of getting people to vote left again so the profession that worries me most, I have to say, because it's the one I'm in, is journalism. Mm -hmm. And I think you see a lot of the same tendencies, uh, in particular the self-censorship. Uh, not surprisingly, I suppose, I mean, a lot of money has gone out of journalism. A lot of people have gone out of journalism. It's become a low paid, um, very temporary and casual sort of work that young people come into and they have no time, no specialism, no support from older journalists. And of course, they're all graduates now and most of them have come in from the sorts of courses where they learned this sort of stuff. Mm. So I'm absolutely astounded at how fast this has happened, that journalism has been hollowed out. And I also see this as part of the political problem because ordinary people slowly get the sense that they're not actually reading what's going on. They're reading a sort of a self-censored version of it in what are meant mm. to be the papers of record. Uh, so you have, a, you have your own magazine, you edit a, a sort of a, a new magazine. Is this part of the motivation for you that you, you see and um, no other place to put the sorts of things that you want to say. Yeah, that, uh, that was why Aereo was, um, was created in the first place by Malham Mali. He wanted something that wasn't um, left wing or right wing, or by, but something that would have views from both sides, but would argue them straightforwardly with um, evidence and reason. And so that, that is what we try to do. We have quite a lot of leftists who write for us, but um, few of them are the social justice leftists. They tend to be socialists or um, social democrats. And we have quite a lot of conservatives as well and, and, um, and Christians, and they will write from, from their belief systems. And this, I think, works well. We don't require people to be apolitical, but we do require them to both state what, their, what political position they're coming from is and try to look charitably and concede as much as they can to the one they're criticizing yeah yeah so that's so okay i'm going to take a bit of a leap a, a, a sort of a sidestep here and say um how fascinating i find it uh, endlessly fascinating the way that uh, race in one bucket and then what we might say sex gender and sexuality in another bucket how incredibly differently theorized these two things are so race which actually is this fluid blurred sort of category uh you know I mean, the, the race line was drawn differently in different countries at different times, etc., is regarded as the most rigid possible thing. Mm. And sex, gender, sexuality, when, you know, sex is incredibly rigid, sexuality for, feels for most people quite binary, not everybody, but most, mm. gender less so, but I mean, compared with race, you know, how did that happen? How did we end up sort of almost the wrong way around there? 
Okay, so I, th I think that we've come from different um, different places. So queer theory, which is where a lot of the sort of gender theory and um, trans activism comes from, that's the most purely postmodern. So it believes that there is a problem with having with knowledge and that it's been constructed in the service of power. So to get at that, we have to look at the categories through which we think and to try to to blur those boundaries, dismantle those categories, and stop um, putting people in. To them they believe that um, if we get rid of all, all categories that aren't you know uh, feminine women attracted to men or masculine man attracted to women then the world will become a more welcoming place to the people who don't um, naturally fit into one of the categories so we've got that whole um, fluid thing going on there and, and in fact queer has become a, a verb and to queer something is to blur the boundaries and to mix up the categories so that that's one particular theory and it relies quite a lot on um, Derrida and Foucault so when we're going into critical race theory this comes from a different um, lineage that has quite a lot of um, of input from the radical new left and then it has the postmodern influence um, on top so Kimberley Crenshaw when she described intersectionality she described it as contemporary politics by which she meant the radical activism um, linked to postmodern theory by which she meant the idea of everything being culturally constructed but she wanted um, some acceptance of objective truth to be there she criticized the postmodernists saying that you know we can't just dismantle everything we have to accept that some things are objectively true or we can't achieve anything so those systems of power and privilege had to be seen as true and i think because this comes from america and because there really has been that rigid line in america you know there has been that one drop rule mm -hmm. where if you are black at all then you are black and so this the whole sort of um identity politics to push back at this has taken this as well as as a solid category they don't think that race is a biological category they do think it's a social construct but they think it's been constructed very simply into white supremacy and black um, subordination hmm. how can we get some of the things that are never talked about in this whole world view that are actually to do with power in particular money and class how can we get money and class back into this sort of discussion poverty I never hear it. I never actually hear poverty or poor, except when it's kind of tagged on to other things, you know, poor black women or, you know, yeah. just I mean, poverty. That, yeah. I, that, I mean, this is why it's been the Marxists who have been criticizing the postmodernists for longest. And we still have the traditional Marxists who are still saying you are dividing the working class. This is now all about rich um, uh, black and white people, usually in universities. We're not looking at economics or class at all now. This is an entirely bourgeois enterprise. And, um, you know, they're, they're criticizing it on these grounds. And so they get quite annoyed when people then call what we're seeing now neo-Marxism, because <laughs> yeah, this is nothing to do with Marx. You can't blame him for this. But I think that there are more connections with the whole sort of revolutionary idea but leaving class out is I, I think one of the 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 most serious drawbacks of the critical race approach because we we can look at race certainly and there are we do, you don't always have to only look at class I think the Marxists are a bit restricted if they only want to look at class in particular in a country in which race has been significant for so long but by only including class when somebody has another intersecting identity that is marginalized we're going to lose a lot of the um of the the sort of empirical analysis that we could have to actually make things better i mean a lot of the reason that um that black Americans have such a lower lower outcomes in life generally is surely because they've only been allowed to try to rise out of the lowest positions for about two generations now. We know that the best indicator of a, an individual's success is if their parents have been successful. So it's not going to happen straight away and it's not going to happen unless we look at social and material factors as well as potential prejudice. And it also seems something that is quite obviously going to create pushback. So if you've got a, I mean, I think you mentioned this in the book, you, you sort of give a hypothetical example of, you know, a very poor white person, like somebody with a really, really hard life. And if the only thing you have to say to that person is, if you'd been black, it would have been even worse. Mm. It's like, oh, come on, you know, and, and if the person saying it is, is a university graduate of mm. whatever, 
race. This yeah. is extremely painful. It sounds like nothing, nobody has anything to offer you and you may as well just go off to the right. Yes, I, I think this does make a lot of, um, of working class people feel alienated. We've seen the surge to the right from the working class both here in the UK, although we can't sort of put too much emphasis on, on that being anything to do with the social justice because there was the whole Brexit thing going on as well. But yeah, the working class are, do seem to be going to the right. They see Trump as having their interests more in mind. They see Boris Johnson as having their interests more in mind. Now, this is this is a really strange development. And I, I think critical social justice ideas have got to take some responsibility for that. So there's something else that you talked about in the book that I thought was really uh, also clarifying for me was that we have three levels of analysis. We could say individual and group and universal. Mm. And as a liberal, the emphasis is really on individual and universal. So we are human beings and that's what we share, but also we're individuals, so we have our own interests. Whereas all these sort of cynical theories that you talk about are really at that middle level group. Uh, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that and whether you think uh, liberals could maybe learn something from that or whether you think that particular slice, way of slicing things through should just be abandoned. I, I, I think it would be great if we didn't have to think in terms of group, but as a tribal territorial species, I think we always will have to. So I think sometimes when the, um, the socialists and the social justice um, scholars have criticised liberalism for focusing too much on the individual having access to everything and our shared humanity and not enough on group, they do make a, a point because it, it, it's quite simplistic to think, well, we just want every individual to be able to do everything and not look at things that could be holding them back from that, which could be their class, could be their race, could be their sex. So we do need to have that kind of focus. And I think the, the liberal civil rights movements of the 60s and 70s, liberal feminism, gay pride, the civil rights movements, they were largely driven by this liberal universalist impulse. They said, we want to have the same rights as everybody else which is very different to the identity um, politics approach, which is we are this group with this source of power, you are a different group, and we are in conflict. Right, so you were saying that maybe the group is the way that, a, a, an, let's see, an inequality lawyer or might look at this would be to say, well, you know, this could be indirect discrimination. There could be something here that it's a facially neutral policy, as they say in American law, meaning everybody has access, but actually not really. Mm. And that could be discrimination. So you can kind of fit it into a liberal framework. You don't have to go the whole way down to, you know, group thought is all. Mm. I, I think we need a liberal framework overall, but one that takes input from, um, from class analysis and, and from identity analysis, because we, that, that is how humans work. I, I think the, the danger of focusing too much on groups is that that brings out the worst of human nature because we are tribal, because it's so easy for us to think well of our own group, demonize an out group, and we become callously indifferent to people who aren't on our team. That's something we need to always protect against, and we need an element of liberal humanism to do that, to be thinking of as many people as possible as coming within our sphere of, of concern. So my, my fear with identity politics is that it, it will lead, um, and it is leading, to, to really harsh conflict and an inability to, to see each other as human beings or as individuals. So the first time I heard of intersectionality, I thought that's what it was trying to do, that it was saying, think about the way that this could be different for people who are different. You know, think, are you actually thinking how this would look to a feminist who's black? Are you thinking about how this might feel to someone who's disabled? And I really liked that idea, but somehow that's not at all how the word has come to, to mean. No, I mean, it, it really could be valuable. I think um, Patricia Hill Collins, who um, sort of developed the, the concept of intersectionality along with um, Kimberly Crenshaw, she points out that in the US, there are very, very different stereotypes um, for black women than they were for black men or white women. So a black woman could be discriminated against in an employment um, position because there was this stereotype that she would be um, aggressive, sexually promiscuous, all these other things which don't, aren't um, considered to be traits of white women. So there, you know, that, that was a, a valid point. That you can't really say, well, this company em employs white women, so there's no sexism, and it includes black men, so there's no racism, if there is a prejudice specifically against black women. So that needs to be in there. But unfortunately, right from the start, um, Kimberly Crenshaw was critical of liberalism. She said it wasn't 
the way to go. She said that taking social significance out of categories um, it sort of disempowers people. We need to, to have a less universal group orientated approach. And she wanted to go with postmodernism, which is all about social constructs. And that really kind of shot itself in the foot because now everything is interpretive everything is theoretical first and then trying to make things fit it and then you get um, people in opposition and in conflict and in competition with each other until you're, you're ending up with this um, really combative uh, approach at looking at what could be a useful theory of understanding how different uh, kinds of identity can can compound each other yeah, and also you have to say then, if you, if you want to take this identity first approach, you have to say that, say, a black woman who doesn't agree with you is somehow got a false consciousness or she's wrong or she's theorised it wrong because you, you know what the black woman or whatever yeah. position actually is. So you end up with somebody like Robert, you know, Robin DiAngelo telling people what they should think, really. Yes, I mean, this is, um, this is something I've, I've been wanting to write about recently. I've just started reading um, a lot of black conservatives, again, in an American context, because I want to, to see, you know, a range of how people are addressing racism. And so I've been reading Shelby Steele, and I think his attitude, he really has got this kind of pull yourself up by the bootstraps attitude, this really typically conservative personal responsibility thing. And I'm looking at him and I'm thinking, I think this for an individual is probably a really, really good attitude, but it's no good for a social policy. You know, you, you, conservatism isn't, a black conservatism is the same as other kinds of conservatism. It focuses too much on the individual's power and not enough on social, on the responsibility of society. So I think we do need to keep pointing out to people who say, well, this is, listen to black people, listen to people of colour, that this is not a monolithic entity. We have a number of black intellectuals and they are to be found all over the political spectrum. What would really be helpful is if people try to look at the good and bad points of all of them. And I think Cornell West does this quite well. I really liked um, reading his Race Matters because he, he's one of his sentences started, my fellow Christian and friend, Glenn Lowry. And then he went through about how he's completely wrong about everything. And I thought, yes, <laughs> this is what we need. We need this kind of attitude. <laughs> Do you think it's fair or unfair to say that postmodernism is a new religion? Is that a, an apt uh, characterization? Well, we, we did a talk on that and, and we said no, but it does, I think, fulfill the same social and psychological needs as religion. I think for purposes of um, the amount of power it can be allowed to have on over how other people think and speak, it should be treated as equivalent to a religion in that it should be pr a protected. People can believe it. They can say so. They can live by it, but they mustn't um, impose it on other people. Right, right. I, I find, I must say, I'm finding the whole thing extremely pessimistic because it's got a lot of things built into it that make it um, very hard to course correct. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this thing of double binds or this thing that, um, you know, if you criticise it, you're just proving that you're a very bad person. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be something that's going to go and go and go and then crash. And I find it hard to be optimistic. You, I think, are a bit more optimistic than me, or at least you were pretending to be in your last chapter. You went through and you said what was worth keeping and what wasn't. Honestly, are you optimistic? I'm not as optimistic as I was a year ago when I finished writing that chapter before we saw all the um, um, protests that we're seeing now. I still don't think this can last um, for long because it's, it is too counterintuitive. And it, it's really... Um, sort of setting itself up against the majority, which that's what worries me particularly. I, I think we could actually see a, a pushback um, on, in the form of white identity politics and socially conservative ideas about um, sex and gender, and that this could um, actually set us back considerably with the amount of progress that we've already made towards um, racial and gender equality. But I'm, I am optimistic in because I, this is a set of ideas that can survive for long term. And the more extreme it gets, I think the, the more liberal lefties who aren't completely committed to social justice ideas are having to admit that there is a problem. There right. And are having to sort of distance themselves from it. So I've seen the, the rise of a, a group that is sort of between me and the social justice 
um, people. So they are now um, criticising me. They're, they're saying that I'm, I'm too dismissive of um, social justice, but they're also picking up the problems in social justice. So I don't think that um, Little Tribe really existed even a, a couple of years ago. So this is something in the leftist academic um, sphere which is already starting to distance itself in a way that it hadn't before so yeah i i think it will happen i think it will gradually get marginalized unless there's you know something dramatic happens first and I, i'm afraid that in america we could even see something equivalent to a civil war at the moment i don't it's it's escalating so fast it's really quite worrying okay i don't want to end on such a pessimistic note so i want to ask you <laughs> if you could pick the things from these cynical theories, because quite often, you know, you're, very, you're a very generous interlocutor. You, you, you often say, you know, I really like this idea or I get something from this or I think there was a really good insight here. Could you pick, say, three things that you think, you know, you learnt and that you'd like to rescue from the conflagration if there is a conflagration? Um, so I, I think in queer theory, um, the pointing out that the way we see uh, sexuality has changed so much in the last century and we shouldn't be too confident that we're now getting it right. Yeah. That is something I could certainly agree with. Um, within critical race theory, hmm, that's a little bit more tricky because it's so, um, it, it's so dogmatic at the moment and it's gone down the path of, of Robin D'Angelo. However, I, I think that we need to point out that there are still some very good um, scholars looking at racial issues who are still accepted within that that sphere like I, I particularly like as I said Michelle Alexander and she is still well regarded by um, the majority of critical race theorists so I think there's space for some improvement there and then when we come to disability and fat studies there's there's some good work in there where we're trying to sort of move the responsibility to be um, you know with disabled people to be fully um, active in society from the in disabled individual to society to to make society more accommodating of disabled people and um, when it comes to obesity to to not consider people uh, people's worth in, in terms of their weight to such an extent that that actually is a, a stigma which isn't helpful so we can I think support those ideas unfortunately um, there's then a lot of nonsense about how you know, being healthy is a social construct, but there, there are good intentions in there. And I think if you've got um, shared goals, but different methods, that's, that's something you can work with. <laughs> well, that's a nice place to stop. Thank you so much, Helen. That was a great discussion. I really enjoyed it.